dive into two-way, sometimes known as factorial analysis of variance. Factorial, I guess they call it that because there's more than one factor. Uh, let me turn the volume down here a bit so we're not clipping. But anyway, the, the two-way analysis of variance, the calculations are relatively straightforward, but they're more complicated than a regular one-way, so I'm just not going to emphasize that in this class. What I'd like to emphasize is somewhat briefly how to interpret this, and that's going to take some thinking. It's going to take some brain breaking here. So the two-way analysis of variance is a situation where you have two factors. You have two independent or predictor variables evaluated together in the way that they influence your dependent or response variable. So you have two independent variables, one dependent variable. It's extremely similar to the situation with an independent, uh, sorry, chi-square test of independence because you have two um, categorical variables in that situation and you're actually evaluating how they influence the frequencies, uh, the, the yes-no-ness of the outcome variable. So there really is this dependent variable thing kind of conceptually there. But here it's quite explicit. The dependent variable is a numerical variable. It's a, this is a, an analysis of variance type situation. So you have a numerical variable that's your dependent variable. So you've got to have three variables total which means you need three columns in SPSS or R, and two of them are going to be categorical, and one of them is going to be numerical. So it, the things that we want to know as a result of this are, first of all, the effect of the first independent variable on the dependent variable. That's what we want to know with a regular one-way uh, analysis of variance. And then we want to know the effect of the other independent variable on the dependent variable, and that's the same thing. That's another one-way analysis of variance. And so the reason we don't do just two separate one-way analyses of variance, one-way ANOVAs, is because we have this thing called the interaction effect. It won't seem that surprising to you if you've been going through the, um, the chi-square independence test stuff, because it's extremely similar to what's happening with an independence test for chi-square. It's the test of independence, essentially, because dependence, independence, it's the same thing as saying an interaction in an analysis of variance. It's the non-parallel lines, does one thing depend on the other thing? Same kind of thing. So we're really interested in that, and you can't get that. You can't get information about the interaction effect, the interaction between the two predictors, between the two independent variables. You can't get that unless you have um, your data set up with paired data, well not paired, so it's a paired type data, so each individual has a value on the first independent variable, the second independent variable, and the dependent variable, unless you have things set up that way and you do a factorial analysis of variance. You need all of this stuff set up together just right. So setting up your design, um, which you'll learn more in research designs, is really important, and once you've set it up you can do this analysis. So when you get to this point, you can evaluate the effect of the first independent variable on the dependent variable with an F ratio and a p-value. Just like for a regular one-way analysis of variance, you figure out the F ratio, the ratio of the estimated variance between groups to the variance within groups, and that kind of isolates for you your, your, significant, your statistical effect, and if that effect is big enough in your sample, then you trust that it's something that's also happening in your population, etc. Well, you have another one of those. You have another one of those for your second dependent, or your second independent variable. The relationship, essentially, between your second independent variable and your dependent variable. In other words, the difference between the means on the second independent variable and the dependent variable. We'll look at this a little more closely in a minute, and hopefully it'll make some more sense. And you have a, sec a second F ratio and a second p-value for that. So you can talk totally separately and totally independently about the effect of you know, this variable on my dependent variable and also the effect of this variable on the dependent variable. And then you have a third F ratio and p-value for the interaction effect. And that's the extent to which the effect of independent variable 1 changes across the levels of independent variable 2 in how they affect the dependent variable. Or you can flip it around and it means the same thing. It's the extent to which the effect of independent variable 2 on the dependent variable changes as you move across the different levels of independent variable 1. If that changes enough, if that depends enough 
uh, on the levels, then you have a significant F ratio for that too. So that's kind of where we're going, where we're going the landscape here. Our data setup is that we have multiple groups. We have two or more levels in factor A, two or more levels in factor B. You can do this two by two. I mean, you can do a regular ANOVA, just two groups. I just tell you not to so that you're forced to practice a few extra things in this class. But um, when you get to factorial vari an analysis of variance and you're comparing means, well, what else are you going to use? There's not a factorial t-test. So it's ANOVA all the way, baby. So you've got to do two levels uh, or more in factor A and two levels or more in factor B. And if you have both of those together, <coughs> then you have the setup for a factorial analysis of variance. So the main effect of one variable is the association between the dependent variable and one predictor. In other words, the variability among means, uh, among the means that are associated with one of the variable's levels. Anyway, we'll talk about this more. It's hard to explain in words. I mean, I can use the words, I just don't think you have the background to really grasp them terribly well until you see some pictures. Once you see pictures and diagrams, I think this is going to start to make some sense. So the main effect of independent variable 1 and the main effect of independent variable 2. Effect on what? Effect on the dependent variable. That's what we always mean by effect. And those two main effects, you might as well just be doing completely separate analyses of variance like two separate one-way analyses of variance. They, it, those effects operate conceptually and mathematically as if the other effect didn't exist. In other words, they are completely independent of each other by definition, by the way things happen. Dependence only happens when we look at the interaction effect, the in, just like for a chi-square, the interaction effect. So to illustrate this, let's look at, the data f at some data from the uh, punishment attitudes data set that I have online. Let's look at some box plots here. This is a matrix of box plots, and we sometimes do this, a matrix of graphs. So there are actually nine cells, nine individual groups of participants that you can think of. If you divide groups up by what subject group they came from, the APA therapists, the ATSA professionals, or the undergrad students from Ohio State, and also whether they saw a child uh, vignette, a vignette with a child offender in it, or whether they saw a vignette with a teenage offender in it, or with an adult offender in it. So you've got nine cells. You've got undergrads who saw a child offender, undergrads who saw a teen offender, undergrads who saw an adult, ATSA members who saw a child, etc. So you've got nine different groups, and we see the box plots of all nine of those groups here. We can see the medians essentially and outliers and you can kind of get an idea of variability and you can look at differences in the means so you can look right here APA you have a median down here the dependent variable here is accountability ratings how they were asked after each of the vignettes how accountable for his actions do you think this offender is so when the offender was a child you have the APA giving very low accountability ATSA giving slightly higher accountability and then the undergrads actually having slightly lower median accountability, but you see there's more variability up here. I believe the mean uh, trends up here a little bit towards this outlying area there. For teenagers, you have a very clear upward progression. You have, it's not huge, but it's clear. Because you have the APA members, and then you have the outside members, slight, assuming that the the offenders are slightly more accountable for their actions, and then the undergrads, assuming they're even more. Now these differences between these medians don't look like much, but that's because the graph has to have enough of a scale to show all of the data. We often zoom in to show differences between means because with big sample sizes, even small differences between means are noticeable and they can be statistically significant. And now when you get to adults, you see the pattern for teenagers repeated except for, um, and, and everybody has higher levels of responsibility or accountability attributed to the offenders. All three groups do, but there's still this pattern where the undergrads have more than the others. So we see a pretty clear set of patterns there. It's actually a little more common to do means plots. Now the, not, the lines don't really mean anything, they just help you organize the groups. So this is the, the teen developmental level, so the hypothetical offender, whether they were a child, a teenager, or an adult. There were not equal ends in here. There were a whole bunch of adults. I took ages and clumped them together for this. So there were a whole bunch of adult ages, and not very many teen and not very many child ages. So the adult ages, there's just a lot 
of participants who saw adults of one kind or another. And then we have the undergrad, the ACA, the APA, and ATSA. And you can see that these lines are not perfectly parallel, and you can try and remember that with an N of 600 or so, that lack of parallelness is probably going to lead to a significant effect. In this case, the significant effect is an interaction effect. The interaction between, let's say, factor A is... Um, the developmental level of the hypothetical teenage or the hypothetical offender, and then factor B is the subject group of the participant. So there's an interaction between those two variables. At least it looks like there's going to be one, but we'd have to test it to see if it's statistically significant and that therefore we can talk about it. So we have these main effects. The main effect of offender age is to say, do the mean accountability ratings vary by offender age? So the hypothesis is exactly the same as for a one-way analysis of variance. We, the null hypothesis would be that the true means of those of the different offender ages, the true means of accountability ratings, are not different between different offender ages. And the alternative is that there that there is variability among those means. So, of course, we're always talking about the population. The main effect of subject group is to say, in the population, do the true mean accountability ratings vary between the APA group, the ATSA group, and the undergrad group? So that's what that means. It's always in the population. The interaction effect is the association of the dependent variable with m both factors at once. So it's a way of measuring association, a way of measuring correlation, kind of. It's not technically correlation, but we know that word. So it's a way of measuring something like that, association. It's a way of measuring dependence, independence. It's all different words to say the same stuff. The reason the two-way ANOVA is better than doing two separate one-way ANOVAs, one for offender age and then one for subject group, because you could do that. The reason the two-way ANOVA is better is because you get that interaction effect. We love that interaction effect. And we can phrase that interaction effect question quite a lot, or in, in quite a lot of different ways. Here's one. Does the effect of offender age on accountability ratings vary by subject group? And what that means, the effect of offender age if you think about it, offender age, if that was one ANOVA, and we just had the three offender ages and accountability ratings, the effect of offender age would be that the accountability rating means were different for different, offend for different uh, offender ages, right? So the effect of offender age means the pattern of, mean, of means in the dependent variable. In this case, the pattern of accountability ratings means. So... That's the effect of offender age. So to say that that's different by subject group means what's the, what's the pattern of means in the dependent variable for APA therapists? Now what's the pattern of means for ATSA professionals? Now what's the pattern of means for... Um, yeah, so what's the pattern of means of the ages for undergrads? So it's a way of putting together all of those things going one by one. Another way to say this is, does the effect of offender age on accountability ratings depend on the subject group? So this is flipping the two independent variables around, because there's no reason why it has to be one of the independent variables is A and the other one's B. It could be the first one's B and the second one's A. So another way to say that is the pattern of, of accountability means the dependent variable different in the different subject groups. So for one subject group, APA, well, let's just look at I don't know why I'm talking about this. Let's look at um, graphs. Now, with the interaction term, it's the same as with everything else. It's the hypothesis test issue and p-values. It's all about what we think is going on in the population. So if there is no uh, dependency among these, among these things, if there's no variation of one effect across the levels of the other variable in the population, then how likely it is that, that we would see what looks like that effect in our in our sample, and that's the p-value. That likelihood is the p-value. So how many hypothesis tests are actually performed if you don't do any post hoc tests in a two-way ANOVA? So think about that for a minute. Here's what two-way ANOVA results look like, and this is results from my data. So you've got the offender developmental level, 
which is the offender age with those three levels, two degrees of freedom because there's three levels. It's got its sum of squares, it's got its mean square, and it's got its f, a huge f, 200 and something. p is less than 0 0.00, lots of zero ones. Then you've got a separate between subjects factor, the effect of the subject group. It has its sum of squares, it has its degrees of freedom. There were three subject groups, APA, ATSA, and undergrad, so therefore three minus one, there are two degrees of freedom. Mean square, F, still pretty big, 44.1. And then you have offender age by subject group. Very small sum of squares, slightly larger degrees of freedom. This degrees of freedom is always this times this. And then the mean square, right here. But the F ratio is 0.8 divided by 0.3. So this F ratio is 15.5 divided by 0.3. This mean square is 78.1 divided by 0.3. All three of these things use the same error term, as we call it. The same within group variability or error variability, residuals, etc. So we divide this, the mean square by the same error term three times. Because this is our estimate of variability that's just due to sampling uh, variation or that's due to factors that we can't control or that we don't understand that aren't dealt with in this in this study. So even with this smallish f, we get uh, a significant f ratio, 0.05. P is less than 0.05. It didn't look like it was going to happen, but it's a large sample size. So let's talk about that effect of offender developmental level or offender age. That was significant. So this is a main effect. We can look at the means in the cells, and that helps sometimes. Sometimes we diagram these things as a two-way table, just like a contingency table for chi-square, except that instead of putting the frequencies in every cell, we put the means in every cell. Every one of those is the mean. So the mean, it's the mean of the dependent variable. So the mean accountability rating that undergrads gave to, to child, undergrads who received child offenders that they gave to the offender was 2.41. Undergrads for teens, 3.36, etc. So just looking at these numbers, you can see things. There's a bunch of twos, there's some twos and a three, and there's some threes. So basically adults are getting more accountability than teens and children. And then you can look at here, undergrads, you've got a two and some threes. ATSA, you've got two twos and a three. And then APA, you've got two twos and a three. So you can see that the APA people are, are a little less likely to hold undergrad, hold the offenders accountable, and the undergrads are more likely. So if we want to look at the main effect of offender developmental level on the accountability ratings, remember the dependent variable is accountability ratings, you need to collapse across the other variable. So the only you have to make this data look exactly like the only thing you have is those three levels, just the child, the teen, and the adult. So you collapse across levels of um, the offender group, or sorry, of the participant group. So you're going to, if you have the original data, you can just pretend like these don't exist and then just take all the, all the responses that were responses to a child offender and find out their mean, all the means of the teen, all the means of the adult. Or you can get the weighted means of the undergrads who responded to the child offender ATSA who responded to the child offender, APA who responded to the child offender. So it's like the mean of these means. Anyway, we call that the marginal levels because it's in the margins of the table. So this 2.34, this is the average response of everybody in the study, no matter what group they were from, to child, a, a child offender. So that's the average accountability rating to a child offender. And then 3.17 is the average accountability rating of everybody in these groups all combined to a teen offender, and then 3.62 for an adult offender. So this is another way of looking at the main effect of one of these factors, the main effect of the offender developmental level. And so that's what we're left with. It's just like a one-way ANOVA with three means. There we go. We could plot those means. Easy peasy. <coughs> it's actually a little more common to look at a means plot like this, and then we can look at the means of each developmental level and we can kind of see those on the on the graph by clumping together all the different sub means so here we've got the child offenders and you can see that there's the overlapping means and confidence intervals for the undergrads the AC, the ATSA and the APA groups 
Well, we can figure out what the mean is of, of those different three means. It has to be a weighted mean because there were way more undergrads than there were of the other groups, and there were more ATSA members than APA members. But anyway, we get the weight, that mean weighted by population, etc. It's the, it's the weighted average of those individual group means, of those three individual group means. And then here, we have another one of those means for just the teenagers. They're a little more spread out, but that's where the mean is right there. And then here for adults, for adult offenders, this is the mean accountability rating. So we can just look at the variability between those means, and that is the variability. That's the between subjects variability that we call the main effect of offender developmental level. Now we need to know the grand mean. The grand mean for the study is here, and it's not in the middle because unfortunately there were an awful lot more adults adult protocols sent out than there were child or teen protocols and so there were so many more of the adults that this mean drags the overall mean up a bit but that's okay the analysis will account for that so the variability between the means in other words their average deviation from the grand mean the, their mean that is the effect of offender developmental level that variability, and we'll divide that by within group variant variance, but that's going to be the sum of squares or the mean square. That's that's what we're representing here for the main effect of de offender developmental level. That's that between groups variance for that factor. So let's talk about the other main effect, the main effect of subject group. Let's go back to these cells, and as you might have guessed, now we're going to go sideways. We're going to collapse across offender developmental levels. We're going to say, what's the mean for all the undergrads, no matter, or the mean rating that all the undergrads gave their offenders, no matter what developmental level the offender was at? Well, the undergrads, the average was 3.39. What about the mean for ATSA members? The average was 3.01. And APA members, 2.87. So it's like the weighted mean of all these things becomes this. Again, the marginal mean, but now the margins are the rows, not the columns. So we're left with just these three things here. One for undergrads, ATSA members, and APA. So let's look at this graph again and make sense of this. Now we need to see not the means within these clusters, but the mean of everything with a solid line, and the mean of everything with a dashed line, and the mean of everything with a dotted line. So I'm just going to do some little... PowerPoint animations here so we can make these circles here and move them over to the side just directly horizontally so we can see how they're related to each other. What's the mean of all the undergrads? Well then that mean is about right there. Now what's the mean of all the ATSA members? That mean accountability rating given by the ATSA members is right there. And what's the mean accountability rating of all the APA members? That's right here. You should practice visualizing these things. Two-way graphs are going to be with you for the rest of your education. We love two-way graphs. Everybody loves a two-way graph. They're just all over the place. And actually remember that there were an awful lot more adult profiles, adult questionnaires out there than teen and child. So uh, these means are all dragged up a little towards the top because there were tons of adults. So now we can look at variability and difference from the grand mean. And we'll get a different answer here. We're going to get the main effect of the subject group, and that's going to be the variability of each of the subject group means from the grand mean. So that's a between group variance for the subject group. Now we could just rearrange the graph and make this a little more direct. So let's rearrange the graph. Now we have the subject group on the axis, and different lines represent the ages of the children. I don't like this as much, but some people might like it just fine. So you have child offenders, teen offenders, adult offenders. Well, maybe I do like it. It's working for me. All right, so we've got this going on here. So we could just look at what's the mean here for the undergrads. There you go. And what's the mean here for ATSA? There we go. And what's the mean dependent variable rating for the APA group? So now we've got the means for the different participant groups, kind of ignoring any distinctions based on how old the, the offender was, so collapsing across those groups. And here's the grand mean, which as you know is dragged up towards the values of the, of the adults and the undergrads because 
there are so many more of all of them. So the deviations of the individual means from the grand mean, the average deviation there, that's going to be our between group variance for the subject group. So just a different way of looking at that. You should go through and practice visualizing these graphs, tr practice trying to see the effects, trying to collapse one way versus collapsing the other way. And now it gets a little harder to explain this. We just need some practice. This is the interaction effect. Offender age by subject group, that X is usually pronounced by, and it's an interaction effect or interaction term. It's an interaction term. We talk about these things as if they were phrases or words. So this is the main effect term, this is the main effect term, and this is the interaction term or the interaction effect. There's all sorts of language to statistics, and especially ANOVA kind of has its own. So let's look at this graph again. The lines are not parallel. So the question is, are they non-parallel enough that we will trust that they represent non-parallel lines in the population, more or less, right? And in fact, we, we saw the table, they are, we get P is less than 0.05. It's not a big effect, F of 2.4, that's probably just barely P is less than 0.05. It's a fairly weak effect. That's because the lines are mostly parallel. Even with hundreds of participants, these lines are not wildly different from each other. So the lines are not parallel, so we can interpret that in two ways. The effect of offender age on accountability ratings depends on the subject group. So offender age, what's the effect of, ender, of offender age at this subject group? The effect is APA is low, ATSA is slightly higher, and then undergrad is higher, and they're all at this fairly low number below 2.5. Those are the accountability ratings for offenders. Is that effect the same as it is here? No, now it's much more spread out. We haven't changed position, but it's more spread out. Now the effect is uh, APA here, ATSA is much higher than APA, non-overlapping, and the undergrads are much higher than both. And are those two the same as this one? No, the effect of, uh, offender, the effect of offender age at this group is different. The, the uh, accountability ratings are different for the pattern among accountability ratings here is different uh, among the different participant groups. It's a little late at night as I'm recording this, so my mouth is kind of dying on me. So the pattern is different. Clustered together, spread out more, and now this one's spread out on the top, but these two are back to being clustered. So the pattern changes. This pattern's one thing, this pattern's another, this pattern's another. Or we can look at it this way. Look, we can look at the effect of ages across the different subject groups here. So um, what's the differences between ages here? We've got child, teen, adult, and that's for among the APA people. The APA people, pretty regular distribution. ATSA, they gave the teens relatively more responsibility. Otherwise, they're kind of similar. There's they're not evenly distributed. The teens are shifted more towards the adults. And then the undergrads, the teens are shifted more towards the adults, but then everything is shifted up, upward. So those patterns change. The pattern of one variable changes, of the, of the means of the dependent variable changes for one variable across the levels of the other variable. So the effect of subject group on accountability ratings changes depending on what offender age there is. So that means there's an association between our two categorical variables, subject group and accountability ratings. And it means there's an interaction between them. They both interact in how they affect our dependent variable. So interactions are the big deal. That's why we do a two-way ANOVA instead of two one-way ANOVAs. Because we want to know about the interactions. If we didn't care about the interactions, we might as well almost just do two one-way ANOVAs because we'd get uh, the same information. The main effects are exactly the same as if you did two one-way ANOVAs. And so we could just do that. But interactions are really cool. They're often what we care about scientifically more than anything else. And in order to, to interpret these interactions, we usually keep the number of levels per factor down to about a handful. It's really odd and really rare to see an ANOVA with more than about five or six levels in any one of the categorical variables. Mathematically, yeah, you can do it, but it gets really difficult to interpret what comes out of that, and it gets kind of messy, too. It, you start to think, am I really discovering some interesting theory, or am I just kind of sifting through my data looking for something? So we try and keep our levels to not crazy numbers of levels. Anyway, 
I think we're going to wrap this up after talking about the conditions briefly. The conditions for a two-way ANOVA are very similar to one-way ANOVA. The, the data have to have been sampled independently, which we're getting used to here. It's for everything. And there needs to be normality, more or less, rough normality in each cell of all the, of the, all the observations rep represented in each cell and all the observations represented in each marginal mean. All those groups need to have more or less normality. And then you need to have equal variances between in all of the cells. Now, equal, equal doesn't mean truly equal. You can get away with pretty big ratios, like if the lowest variance in one cell and the highest variance in one cell, the ratio is 3 or 4 or 5 to 1, you're probably still kind of okay. There's different rules out there. 3 to 1 is a good rule. Some people go as high as 5 or 6 to 1. Anyway, it gives you an idea that you can have really big differences in variance, which is much smaller differences in standard deviation. But it's uh, if you violate that, that's really bad, but it's not as easy to violate it as you might think. So anyway, we're going to wrap up, and I'm going to go through another example in the next video.